My name is uh, Jacob Slippincott. I do sales and support for Proteum Software. Now that Brian's talked about the background and the technology behind DIA, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to use scaffold DIA for the analysis of uh, DIA data. So the objectives for this portion are to learn about the two workflows for loading data, learn how to load a data set, and explore some of the data analysis features contained within scaffold DIA. So before we get into the workflow, let's talk about two types of data that you will encounter um, when working with scaffold DIA. So data type one is reference data. So this is captured in DIA mode, and this is what you're going to build an eLib chromatogram library out of. Um, and these are usually created from a pooled sample that have been injected multiple times, uh, and then the MZ range has been limited using gas rates fractionation. And this allows us to get a really narrow isolation window in our reference data, which allows us to get uh, really deep coverage into the proteome that you're studying um, and provide a high quality library. In contrast to that, experimental data these are the samples that you are trying to study in order to gain biological insight. Uh, these are also captured in DIA mode, but using wider isolation windows. Okay, so let's talk about some files for searching now that we've captured some of this data. So as I alluded to earlier, there's an eLib or chromatogram library, and this is created from reference DIA data by searching a fast day of eLib or an existing library. And this is unique to Scapel DIA, but can be reused. Um, a BLIM is a, another type of library, but that is created from DDA data, and these are available from Skyline, multiple online sources, or available as an export from Scaffold. Finally, if you do not have one of these libraries available, you can use a FASTA file that matches the organism in question. This is good for small exploratory data sets or in order to generate an eLib library. Okay, so Scaffold DIA contains two workflows depending on what type of data you have available. The first workflow allows you to simply search experimental data against an existing library or file. And again, this can be a FASTA, a BLIB, or a previously created ELIB. The second workflow allows you to create an ELIB from reference data and search it all at once. And as I indicated, a BLIB is um, available as an export from Scaffold. So what you would do is you would load your DDA data into a search engine of your choice. You would process it using your search engine, load it into Scaffold, and then from the export menu in Scaffold, you can um, export a BLIB. So now that I've gotten into this, let's actually go into the program and um, we'll work through the workflow that I love. So as I said, in order to start a search, you have to um, access the workflow dialog. We will do that using the new button found on the Welcome to Scaffold DIA um, menu that's available when the program launches. Let's come up for just a second. And here, so this is the workflow. The workflow dialog. So we are going to use the second workflow. This is to create a reference library and search data against it. And you'll see these yellow triangles scattered throughout the workflow um, dialog. These indicate that the user's attention is needed um, in order to set a parameter. And then once all of these yellow triangles are cleared, you can proceed with searching. Um, and when they're finished, you'll see they're replaced by these green check marks. So first, let's go ahead and save our reference library. So we'll click choose. And this will bring up a dialog where we can choose a position, a location to save our library and name it. We'll just go ahead and name it as the default, and we'll go ahead and click Save. So now let's expand the reference library creation parameter set. So this is where a bulk of the parameters live, and these are all related to setting the parameters defined for the reference library search. And here, as I indicated, you have a couple options um, as for how to search your data to create it. You have the option to use a fast day or to use an existing VLIB or ELIB. We're going to use a FASTA, so I'll click on here, and I'll navigate to where our FASTA file is stored on our computer. And this is just a regular FASTA file that was downloaded from the Unifrog server. We'll go ahead and click on that. Okay. And now, next you'll see down here there are a fair amount of parameters that are familiar to most people who've carried out DDA searches, such as peptide length, peptide charge, and precursor and fragment tolerance. We'll go ahead and leave these set as default. Now let's go ahead and pick our reference data file. So remember, these are the, only the ones that we're going to use for our reference data search. The um, experimental data files are loaded separately. So let me navigate to these. And I'm going to select all six of uh, these have been the written or the MZ ranges have been narrowed by against the expression So we have six files to load. Next, you can define any modifications of interest. 
And then the last one I want to talk about right here is the peptide FDR threshold. So this is, it's important to set this properly here because once you set this and the data is processed, you cannot change the peptide FDR threshold. And this is set to 1% by default. Next is the data acquisition side. So this should match how your windowing scheme was set up when you collected the data via your mass pack. And we'll go ahead and set this to standard windows because this is standard window data. And you'll notice here, once I've set that parameter, all the reference library creation parameters are set. And we don't see any more triangles there. So we'll click to collapse that and we'll expand our reference data search parameter. So this is highlighting where all the parameters are stored that control the experimental data search. And you see most of these are carried over. You want to make sure that your digestion enzyme is right. And now I'll navigate to the experimental data files. Click that. And that one's ready to go. Now if you move over to the analysis tab, this sets a couple parameters that you can redefine after your data is loaded if you would like, including shared evidence clustering, um, the target protein FDR, and the minimum number of peptides. And then finally on the advanced tab, you want to point scaffold DIA to a process and directory, and this is where we'll write intermediate files during processing. So now we see all of our triangles are cleared. We have green checks. We could go ahead and click load data to begin the search. The last thing I want to call to your attention here are the workflow, workflow button files, or the workflow file buttons, excuse me. So the save workflow as button allows you to save your parameters into a workflow file that you can then um, use to load data again when you want to use those parameters again. And in order to do that, just click on the load workflow from file button. So I've gone ahead and processed a file. And this is what it looks like once it finally loads. You see all your, your proteins of interest are listed here. So before we go in and start actually looking at some of this data, we need to organize our experiment. So what does that mean? Well, organizing files in scaffold DIA means that you tag your samples with attributes that are explain or you know define what those samples are. Um, so these could be, um, you know, categories or something like that that help you understand what your samples are and then move that data into scaffold DIA. So this is done by adding attribute groups and then defining attributes within those attribute groups. So in order to show how this is done, I'm going to first, I'm going to add an attribute over here. So what this is, this is a time course study that was done on multiple biological replicates. And you'll see I've already created this um, time attribute group and then define a few attributes in here. So let's go ahead and add a new one. So we'll click on that add attribute button. We'll come down here and select add new. And let's go ahead and add a bio rep attribute group and we'll define the fact that there are two biological replicates in this experiment. So we'll do bio rep and then one and we'll add that and you see it's added over here. Now we'll click on this again and we'll add bio rep number two within this biological replicate group. Okay, so now that we have all of our attributes and attribute groups defined, we have to actually tag our samples with these. So the easiest way I think to do this is to click to highlight a group of samples that you want to define. So I'll grab all of the one replicates, I'll highlight them, right click, navigate over, and we'll define these as one. Now we'll highlight our other set of samples, right click, and we'll define these as biological replicate too. Okay, we have all of our biological replicates defined. If, for convenience sake, we have the ability to import an attributes file, either from an existing scaffold DIA experiment or create it in Excel. So I'm going to click on the import attributes file button. I'm going to navigate to the attributes file that I've already saved. And I'm going to click open. And you'll see the attributes for all 12 samples were imported. So now we can kind of see how our experiment is set up in scaffold DIA. So we'll see we have our biological replicates applied and we have all of our time points for all of our samples. And you'll see here, for example, um, 1A and 2A, those are both the zero hour. They're both tagged with the zero hour with their proper biological replicate. Okay, so now we're almost ready to start looking at some data. But before we need to do, before we do, we need to set the summarization level. So what the summarization level does is it allows for the proper rollup of samples within categories and allows you to do statistical analysis properly. So what I did was I clicked on the summarization dropdown and then I went to edit. 
And with that, we'll do, we'll bring up this edit experimental design box with attributes on the side and the experimental design on the other side. So what we need to do is we need to move these individual attribute groups from one side to the other. So this is going to add them to the experimental design. So I use the arrows in the middle here, and then the arrows on this side control the hierarchy of your attribute group. So you want to make sure that this matches your experimental design properly. So for example, since this is a time course study, we want to have time on top and then biological replicate under it and then MS symbol under that. And now what we need to do is we need to set the comparison level, the biological replicate level, and the technical replicate level. So the comparison level is the summarization level that your statistical analysis is actually done on. Since I said this is a time course experiment, we want to set that to the time attribute group. And then we'll set the biological replicate level to, to the bio rep, and then the technical replicate level will stay on the MS sample level. And finally down here on this side, we can set the summarization level to time. And what this is going to do is this is going to actually set the level that is displayed at when we go back to the samples view. So we'll click on OK. Our samples are now organized, so we can go back to the samples view. And if I move over to this side, we'll see all of our different levels here. So we have zero hour, two hour, all the way through 24 hour. And all of our quantitative values are rolled up to the proper attribute group level. Okay. Now that we've got all of our samples defined properly, let's go ahead and take a look at a protein in a little bit more detail. So this is a um, serum starvation um, experiment done using HeLa cells. So we would expect that the proteasome proteins would be affected by the treatment. So I'm going to go ahead and use the search box, and I'm going to type in proteasome proteins so I can filter the list of proteins of interest. So if you have a group of proteins that you know you're interested in, um, using that search box is a really easy way to um, sort of narrow down your list and find the ones that you're looking for exactly. So let's take a look at this one in particular. And we'll see here, this is displaying all of the protein information across all samples. It's giving some more um, information about intensities, retention times, and everything like that. So what we've done now is we've drilled down into an individual protein of interest. And we can here, we can check out these protein level charts. This is going to um, plot the intensities across all of the experiments. And we can see that, that at each time point, these, um, there's a difference in the intensity across samples here. So as indicated, all of the quantitation is done on fragment ion intensities in scaffold DIA. So what now we want to take a look at are these fragment ion chromatograms that we have here that display all of the B and Y ions that were used to identify your your, per, your, your peptides excuse me, and give you um, the intensity values. So I'll zoom in here a little bit. And we see we have a nice peak of all of these B and Y ions. And we also show the precursor chart here. Now, as I indicated, all of the um, quantitation is done at the fragment level, but having the precursor chart is nice because it shows if there's any precursor interference. And we can see in this peptide, for example, there's a whole lot of interference at the precursor level. But if we come and look over here, these fragment levels, this is a nice peak. So we know that we're getting accurate quantitative values even when there's precursor intensity interference. All right, so now we're going to go back out. We're going to take it a little more at a higher level. So let's remove this. And now let's add a statistical test to determine if there's any um, significance in the differential expression. I'm going to come up to the experiment menu and click on quantitative analysis. And this quantitative analysis dialog is where you can add tests, uh, you can configure the significance level. Um, we have a couple different tests that are available depending on what kind of data you have loaded. Now, this is a theorem. This is a serum starvation study, and it's time for us. But we've, lo we've loaded a pretty small number of replicates into um, this demo file for the ease of being able to um, visualize the results. So we don't have the full statistical power of the entire experiment. Um, so I want to come down here, and I want to click on this t-test, or ANOVA. And because I want to do a quick demonstration of something, um, I'm going to apply a t-test, even though that might not be technically the best way to look at some of this data. Um, so what I want to do is I want to remove a couple of the factors from the experiment. These are not the ones that we're interested in. Um, and this will allow us to look at a t-test comparing um, the 2-hour to the 16-hour. 
and then significance level. So here, um, by default, Scaffold adds the Benjamini Hopper procedure for multi-test correction. Because we don't have the full statistical power of the experiment, I'm going to go ahead and disable that for now, but we'll leave the significance level to 0.5. And we'll go ahead and apply that. And now you can see the t-test values are added for that comparison. So now that we have the t-test value, let's take a look at the volcano plot. So we'll come into the visualize view. We have a couple of different plots here um, that I would like to show you. So while the volcano plot is building, um, we have a couple other plots. As I said, we have a quantitative scatter plot, which shows um, the values between two of your um, two of your samples. So you can look for um, you know outliers, see if there are any proteins of um, interest here that you want to interrogate further. Um, and then down here we have a couple charts related to go terms. So I have the go terms. Um, already applied, um, as you might have seen in the sample to you. I'll explain how to add those in a few minutes. But this is a pie chart that shows um, kind of the total number of each, um, uh, you know, number of proteins in each go term group. So we can come in here and we can say, oh, um, you know, a bunch of uh, reproductive proteins are affected by this treatment. That might be a pathway that we need to explore a little further, or transport proteins. Um, you know, biological regulation. It gives you some information about the biological significance of each one of these proteins. So here you can see the quantitative scatter plot is built. We can see there's an outlier here. If we hover over it, we'll see that this is protein we might want to, um, you know, follow up and investigate that one a little bit more. But now that our volcano plot is built, um, so here we're looking at the full change um, versus the significance. So all of these green proteins up here are going to be significant. Let's go ahead and use one of the features that we have of this. So all of these, all of the charts are interactive. So what we can do is instead of just looking at it, we can change the multi-select action and we can add some orange stars. So click and drag over a portion. And now what we've done is we've starred all of those proteins of interest. And remember, all of these proteins have, a sig have significant differential expression. So these are ones that we should probably follow up on. So now let's return to the samples queue. And what I can do is I can sort on the stars and pull only the ones that are starred out. And we know we need to follow up on those further. So let's go ahead and sort on the stars. And we'll get all of these starred proteins up to the top. And now, now that we have all of these starred proteins up, we know we want to hone in on these proteins for a little bit. So let's go ahead and hide the proteins we're not interested in. So these are going to hide the unstarred protein. So now we have, we've proved down our list. So all of the proteins that we're showing right now, all of these have significant differential expression. And these are the only ones that we're looking at right now. We've hidden the other ones. So now that we have a small list of statistically significant proteins, let's go back to the visualized view and go to the Go Connections graph. And here what we can see are these are a list of just um, statistically significant proteins that we're going to be interested in. And we can see how they cluster based on their Go terms. And that's what I can do here. So I can just label these. And we can see all of the um, all the names for all of the proteins. So the last thing that I want to bring up is um, Scaffold DIA has principal component analysis built in. So from the visualized view, we can do this and click on the PCA tab, and we can see how all of our samples group together.